In the year 1734, three miners were taken aback when they discovered a male body inside Hallstatt salt mine. The body was well preserved, having been mummified by salt. Accounts at the time said that the dead body, completely embedded into the rock salt deposits, was discovered following a collapse in the kilb work. His shoes and traces of his clothes had been preserved. One can even see a bit of cloth on his dress and the remains of the shoes on his feet. The mine workers assumed that it was the long dead body of a miner who had lived before the first official records, that is, more than 400 years earlier. But after a thorough analysis and investigation, today's assumption is that this man was the victim of a mining accident approximately 1000 BCE, so roughly 3000 years ago. The heyday of prehistoric mining was in the late Iron Age, between 800 and 400 BCE. At that time, miners would penetrate as much as 200 meters into the mountain, in the Austrian Alps, extracting not gold or precious metals, but copious amounts of salt, about half a ton a day with hand tools, supplying salt to half of Europe, more than 2,000 years ago. Why was so important to extract salt so many miles inland, near the Alps, up in the mountains, so many thousands of years ago? Why ancient peoples would risk their lives dying in collapsed mines? What is the significance of salt in our history? Hello, this is the Delicious Legacy Podcast, and I'm your host, Thomas Dinas. Welcome back to another archaeogastronomical adventure. Salt, salt. Salty, salty, salt. I love the story of salt, because it has so many myths and stories and legends intertwined and all these different idioms and sayings about salt signify and highlight the importance of salt in society and in life in general. Its value isn't simply monetary, but something very significant and part of every civilization through the ages. Salt has then a long, long history, obviously. There's a lot to talk about and a great scope to explore countless civilizations, check some fascinating historical facts and uses of salt throughout the ages plus popular myths about it, so sit back, relax, and enjoy. As kids, I'm sure you'll know, or at least you have tasted out of curiosity or accident, your sweat or your tears, playing sports with friends, sweating, wiping your forehead with your arm, or feeling the sweat running down your face to your mouth, and of course, the tears too. I bet you cried your little eyes out. What was the saying? Sweat, tears, and see, they all cure or something? Well, they do seem to be my cures as well. And all three things are salty. Coincidence, I wonder? Of course, we could start, and we should start with describing what salt is, right? But maybe doing some basic chemistry here would be quite boring. But in short, salt is a mineral. Sodium chloride. Its chemical compounds and compositions and the role it plays in the universe as an electrolyte, they're all very important stuff, but salt is so much more than that and much prettier than that. All of us um, who grew up in the, um, at least in the last 70 years, so after World War II and these industrial and post-industrial societies, we all um, seen the fine, free-flowing, Uh, white salt into our minds, I think. Salt is white. But this couldn't be further from the truth. Salt comes in a vast array of colors. And of course, in a few different flavors. It's not just salty. Of course, there's high importance in salt uh, for cultural reasons, but also biological reasons too. We are compelled to eat salt biologically. And of course, without it, we just don't have the same flavor on food. The very basic thing 
to understand is that all salt comes from the sea, from the ocean, being in the Atlantic or the Mediterranean, and we just evaporate it, or in prehistoric lakes, and we mine it from uh, the deepest mountains. And salt is there to amplify the flavor of foods. So in a way, could we say that salt is a delicacy? According to Plutarch, who described it as the noblest of foods, the finest condiment of it all, it seems the answer is yes. So there is no difference between sea salt and rock salt when they are both pure. But of course, they seldom are, particularly sea salt, which occurs in its natural state, accompanied by potassium and magnesium chloride and calcium and magnesium sulfates, all of them dissolved into the water of the sea. Sea salt also contains iodine and organic microparticles. Rock salt is a mixture of sodium chloride and a double sulfate of sodium and calcium called slot. Sea salt is made on shores offering certain facilities, a flat terrain, a sea warm enough for an adequate degree of salinity, a climate with plenty of sun and moderate constant winds. Such conditions occur on a few Mediterranean coasts, on the Atlantic coast of between Brittany and Ghana, the shores of the China Sea and Madagascar, and a number of coastal areas in the southern United States and Central and South America. But many other countries are not so favored, and so they discovered very long ago how to extract salt artificially. Necessity is indeed the mother of invention. Okay, firstly, we need to understand um, the three ways to make salt. So there's the rock salt mining, which uh, happens underground, with the salt being physically dug out of the ground. Nowadays, enormous machines work in a network of gigantic caverns and tunnels, drilling, blasting and crushing the rock. And most of this salt dug out of the ground is used for keeping the roads free of ice during winter. There's the brine evaporation, and in hot countries, salt is produced by allowing the sun to evaporate seawater in shallow pools, which doesn't happen in the UK, unfortunately, because there's no... Well, the temperatures aren't so high and there's a lot of rainfall. And there's also the white salt production, which is known as solution mining, which is the most common process used in Northern Europe to make both industrial and edible salt. In solution mining, water is pumped into underground rock salt deposits to create brine that is then pumped back into the surface. The brine is then evaporated in huge evaporating vessels to make the familiar white salt. This salt can be used in industry, by food manufacturers, and of course at the table. Historically, Sir Humphrey Davy, who lived uh, at the end of the 18th century and beginning of the 19th, was the first person to separate salt into its constituent parts of sodium and chlorine. He did this in 1807. Salt was of a great importance in folk customs across the ages and was associated with fertility. For example, the Romans called the man in love, Salax, in a salted state, which is the origin of the world, Salacius. In the Pyrenees, bridal couples went to church with salt in their left pockets to guard against impotence. In some parts of France, only the groom carried salt, in others only the bride. In Germany, the bride's shoes were sprinkled with salt. In many Eastern European countries and in Jewish tradition, there's the ceremony of bread and salt. We have sayings, take something with a pinch of salt. Be worth of one's salt. Rub salt into the wound. Eat salt with someone. Salt of the earth. From the Bible, I think. I think even Egyptians used salt uh, to make mummies. Salt preserves, as we've seen, obviously, from the story with the miners in the Austrian Alps. Salt preserves, and that helps us humans have abundance of food in uh, the winter months. Ancient Egyptians, Greeks and Romans included salt in sacrifices and offerings, and they invoked gods with salt and water. Around 4,700 years ago, the Chinese Pong Zhao Kanmu, which means the classic herbal, the first ever treatise on pharmacology, in one of the earliest known writings, recorded more than 40 types of salt. It described two methods of extracting and processing salt, similar to some methods still in use today. 
writings of salt no doubt also exist on the clay tablets of ancient Babylon and on Egyptian papyri. Salt making and use was a feature of life in all ancient communities. In China, the earliest uh, written record of salt production is from about 800 BCE and tells of production and trade of sea salt from a millennium before that. The techniques used on this account, they were considered old by the time it was written and describes putting ocean water in clay vessels and boiling it until reduced to pots of salt crystals. There's also evidence in China that um, used iron in the salt making process, so producing salt in pans. It is believed to have made salt by boiling brine in iron pans, an innovation which would become one of the leading techniques for salt making for the next 2000 years. The ancient Egyptians made salt by evaporating seawater in the Nile Delta. They also may have procured some salt from Mediterranean trade. They clearly obtained salt from Africa trade, especially from Libya and Ethiopia. But they also had their own desert of dried salt lakes and salt deposits. It is known that they had a number of varieties of salt, including a table salt called northern salt and another called red salt, which may have come from a, a lake near ancient Memphis. More than a gastronomic development, the salting of fowl and especially of fish was an important step in the development of economies. In the ancient world, the Egyptians were leading exporters of raw foods such as wheat and lentils. Although salt was a valuable commodity for trade, it was bulky. By making a product with the salt, a value was added per pound. And unlike fresh food, salt fish well handled would not spoil. The Egyptians did not export great quantities of salt, but exported considerable amounts of salted food, especially fish, to the Middle East. Trade in salted foods would shape economies for the next four millennia. And around 2800 BCE, the Egyptians began trading salt fish for Phoenician cedar, glass and purple dye made from sea cells by a secret Phoenician formula. The Phoenicians had built a trade empire with these products, but in time they also traded the products of their partners, such as Egyptian salt fish and North African salt throughout the Mediterranean. Conserving food was a matter of life and death, especially when food supplies were limited and uh, were very local in origin. So how long will individual food last? What can be done to prolong the life? And will the last year's crop last until the next year is ready? Many of the familiar flavors of the ancient uh, world, and of course our modern world, originate in the necessity to conserve food. Not only dried fruit, but also wine and vinegar, and biscuits and cheese and bacon and other salt uh, meats and salted and smoked fish, amongst other stuff. And of course, fish sauce. Raw salted meat and fish in ancient Greeks called omotarichos and held no fears for Greeks and Romans. It was eaten quite um, often. Salt played an important role in ancient Roman and Greek uh, life and cuisine. And of course, uh, they used it to, to preserve olives and make them uh, palatable. Um, they used it to make hams and Cato, like many Romans, was a big fan of uh, hams. On Cato's uh, book, De Agricultura, from the 2nd century BC, we have a recipe uh, about preserving a pork leg in salt. And it goes like this. After buying legs of pork, cut off the feet. Half peck ground Roman salt per ham. Spread the salt in the base of the vat or jar. Then place a ham with the skin facing downwards. Cover completely with salt. Then place another above it and cover it the same way. Be careful not to let the meat touch meat. Cover them all in the same way. When all are arranged, cover the top with salt so that no meat is in and level it off. After standing in salt for five days, take all hams out with the salt. Put those that were above below and so rearrange and replace. After a total of 12 days, take out the hams, clean off all the salt and hang them in the fresh air for two days. On the third day, clean off with a sponge, rub all over with oil, hang in smoke for two days. 
On the third day, take down, rub all over with a mixture of oil and vinegar and hang in the meat store. Neither moths nor worms will attack it. Of course, this kind of preserved meat it was quite a delicacy for the, for the ancient uh, higher classes, aristocracy of uh, the Roman society. The plebs and the lower classes, they would do with um, olives perhaps, a bit of cheese and some uh, preserved vegetables. Again, if you remember from our episode, The History of Olive Oil, we have recipes um, from Cato on how to preserve olives. And of course, the most important part of um, every Roman and ancient Greek table it was uh, the garum, the fissos, which was made by salt and fish. Uh, those, they were the ingredients. Yeah, garum was the centerpiece of Roman cuisine. From uh, my favorite uh, person of the ancient world, Archestratus, we have, um, we have recipes for tuna, both fresh and salted and stored in jars. So he's saying, from the life, we have this from the life of luxury, Take the tail of the female tuna, and I'm talking of the large female tuna, whose mother city is Byzantium. Then slice it and bake it, all of it properly, simply sprinkling it lightly with salt and brushing it with oil. Eat the slices hot, dipping them into sharp brine. They are good if you want to eat them dry, like the immortal gods in form and stature. If you serve it sprinkled with vinegar, it will be ruined. Pliny the Elder, in his Natural Histories, tells us, by Hercules, then, life cannot be lived humanely without salt. It is such an essential substance that its name is transferred to powerful mental pleasures too. All the charm and the greatest humor of life, along with rest from work, are called salts. It rests on this more than any other. Of course, one of the most popular stories with salt is when the Romans sacked Carthage in 146 BCE. Supposedly, the Roman general Scipius Aemilianus salted the earth to eradicate Carthage for good, making the fertile land into desert, in um, inverted commas. And this is one of my favorite um, myths about salt, really. The potency to destroy complete cities and this salting of the earth. But... Um, as we will see, it's a complete myth. It's not uh, real. The destruction part of uh, Carthage by the Romans was absolutely real. And it was truly horrific. We have an account from Appian, which is a real nightmare fuel. I'll be back after this short break, where we hear from my friends Dr. Neil Battery and also the partial historians. See you soon. Hello there, sorry to interrupt. My name's Dr. Neil Buttery and I'm host of the British Food History Podcast, a podcast that you, as a fan of the delicious legacy, might be interested in. I explore British food and its history in all its glory, with interviews with special guests, recipes, reenactments, and tracking down forgotten recipes and hyper-regional specialities. Previous topics include medieval eels, 18th century dining, curry, London street food sellers, breakfast, and the good old Yorkshire pudding. Search for the British Food History Podcast wherever you get your podcasts. And now, back to the delicious legacy. Cheers. Hello, hello. This is Dr. Ran. And this is Dr. G. And together, we're the co-hosts of The Partial Historians. We love ancient Rome and all the quirks that humanity has to offer. Our podcast combines analysis discussion about sources, and a good dash of irreverence. As lovers of the delicious legacy, we know you have an appetite for the delights of the ancient world. Join us for our narrative episodes as we explore the history of Rome from the founding of the city. You can find The Partial Historians wherever you listen to quality podcasts such as The Delicious Legacy. We're out and about on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. And now, back to your regular program. Today's episode is brought to you with the welcome support of Malbin Greek, UK's leading Greek delicatessen, supplier and distributor of premium Greek produce. Whatever your needs, Malbin Greek has you covered. You can shop online and have the divine and delicious goods delivered to your doorstep across the UK, or you can visit the shop at Art17 Apollo Business Park, Lucy Way, SC16, 4ET, Bermondsey, London. Malbin Greek, the one-stop shop for your Greek fix. Who was Appian, an ancient Greek historian from Alexandria, born in 95 AD and died around 165 AD, who flourished under Emperor Trajan 
Adrian and Antoninus Pius, and a writer of the partially surviving The Roman History in 24 books. Here's an extract from the Punic Wars. Check it out. Now Scipio hastened to the attack of Bursa, the strongest part of the city where the greater part of the inhabitants had taken refuge. Six days and nights were consumed in this kind of fighting, the soldiers being changed so that they might not be worn out with toil, slaughter, want of sleep and these horrid sights. Scipio alone toiled without rest, hurrying here and there without sleep, taking food while he was at work until, utterly fatigued and relaxed, he sat down on a high place where he could overlook the work. Much remained to be ravaged, and it seemed likely that the carnage would be of longer duration. But on the seventh day, some suppliants presented themselves to Scipio bearing the sacred garlands of Aesculapius, whose temple was much the richest and most renowned of all in the citadel. These, taking olive branches from the temple, besought Scipio that he would spare the lives of all who might wish to depart from Bursa. This he granted to all except the deserters. Forthwith there came out fifty thousand men and women together, a narrow gate in the wall being opened and a guard furnished for them. The Roman deserters, about nine hundred in number, despairing of their lives, betook themselves to the temple of Aesculapius with Hasdrubal and his wife and their two boys. Here they might have defended themselves a long time, although they were few in number, on account of the height and rocky nature of the place, which in time of peace was reached by an ascent of sixty steps. But finally, overcome by hunger, want of sleep, Fear, toil, and approaching dissolution, they abandoned the enclosures of the temple and fled to the shrine and roof. But the salting the earth story is pure myth. From ancient accounts, we don't have a shred of evidence to suggest that it happened. According to Dr. Peter Gainsford of... Uh, the famed blog Kiwi Hellenist, uh, this um, story didn't appear until the 1800 AD, so roughly just 200 years ago. And so how did that uh, um, very new story become part of our popular imagination? That's a good question. So if we look closely, it turns out that salting the earth isn't about destroying fertile land and turning it into desert. The salt is actually meant to be a fertilizer. Wait, what? When we think of deserty things and destroyed things, we talk about the Dead Sea or the salt floods of Utah, which are barren and desolated and dead places. The clue for the Dead Sea is in the name, I guess. And they're all salty and hot as hell. But in fact, salt was regularly used as a fertilizer in the past. Of course, one has to be much more careful with it than with other fertilizers. Too much will kill of the plants and it will only work for some plants, and you don't put it on the roots, according to our ancient sources at least. But within those limits, it has been used regularly, and it may well be very effective. Plants need salt too, as we do animals. And even in modern era, there were many experiments with salt as a fertilizer in the 1800s. So the American Farmer's Magazine talks about the application of salt as manure, and tells us the application of common salt as a fertilizer has been partially understood and practiced by a few of our agriculturists, but we very much doubt whether the full benefits of this substance have been derived by those even who have made the experiment and in some degree realized the advantage it affords. Of course, we're talking about specifically about the sodium chloride, not uh, Epsom salts or saltpeter or what, what have you. So going back to our Greco-Roman um, sources and Greco-Roman witnesses, we have um, a few things on the subject. Firstly, by Theophrastus on the effects in plants. We've seen Theophrastus in the past before. Still, saline water is beneficial even for some vegetables, as cabbage, beet, rue, and rocket. This improvement occurs, and in a world salinity is good for these vegetables because they have a certain bitterness in their natures, and the salt water 
by penetrating the plants and, as it were, opening outlets, extracts it, which is why Kabat is best in briny soil. And again, further down in uh, his book, on the effects of plants, we said earlier that salinity is also suited to some vegetables and that soda is used with others. And so it seems we must accept the salinity here too, in pomegranate and almond trees, as appropriate to the plants, since it is evident that the sweetness of these vegetables comes from the saline water and the food. And elsewhere, he repeats that cabbage and purslane grow sweet and have little bitterness in saline soil. And he claims Egyptian olive oil isn't as good as the Greek such stuff because it doesn't get enough salt. But he really goes all out when it comes to date palms. Ancient date growers didn't just add a few grains of salt, according to Theophrastus. The date palm likes a soil which contains salt. Wherefore, where such soil is not available, the growers sprinkle salt about it. And this must not be done around the actual roots. One must keep the salt some way off and sprinkle about 5 kilograms. When the tree is a year old, they transplant it and give plenty of salt. And this treatment is repeated when it is two years old, for it delights greatly in being transplanted. From uh, Theophrastus' Historia. And elsewhere, he mentions that Babylonian date growers use salt, but not manure, for their fertilizer. And that another method of application is manually applying lumps of salt to trees. Theophrastus' experience must have been with very salt-starved soil. Modern research has shown that date palms do tolerate relatively high salinity. But as with anything, that tolerance has limits. And as far as we know, modern date growers don't use salt as a fertilizer. And this uh, salt as fertilizer reading also gives us another insight to expose another allusion in um, Matthew, in the Bible, you are the salt of the earth. And I guess this is not only because people are flavorsome or good for preserving foods, but also good on at growing things. All in all here, we have clearly seen that Carthage wasn't ploughed and salted, but some places in history could have been. But the way, anyway, the idea was, yes, indeed, they want to eradicate the city, but not eradicate all life altogether. The idea, I guess, it was to turn it from a city to a green space covered with uh, weeds. And for that reason, yeah, you need salt to use as fertilizer. But that's not what happened in Carthage. Carthage was uh, rebuilt later on by the Romans. It was an important city for a few hundred years afterwards. Another myth um, about salt and uh, Rome is that the Roman soldiers were paid in salt. So according again to Dr. Peter Gainsford, who is a classicist and author of the blog Kiwi Hellenist, so basically the myth in a sense is that the word salary comes from the Latin word for salt because the Roman legions were sometimes paid in salt. And this seems to be pure fantasy in a sense. The English word salary does it didn't come from the Latin salarium, which means stipend, money allowance, and salarium does indeed appear to have linked to salt via the adjective salarius, which is pertaining to salt. From our evidence, from written evidence, there isn't the tiniest scrap to suggest that this was happening, that the Roman soldiers were, were paid in salt. At all, to any extent, ever. It seems that people, again, first started writing about this idea around the 1860s. And then there's another older primary form of the myth that the soldiers were given salt money, basically monetary allowance for buying salt. Again, that seems to be a modern invention. And the only thing we have is from Pliny the Elder that salt is also related to magistrates and duty abroad. And that's where we get the word salaries. That's from Pliny. And then the historian Livy reports how the Roman censors imposed the new tax in 204 BCE. The censors also imposed a new tax on the annual salt production. They set it to be offered at the same price in Rome, but more in town squares and marketplaces, and at other rates in other places. It was widely believed that just one of the two censors devised this tax. As a result, the censor Marcus Livius was given the nickname Salt Dealer. 
the phrase worth he sold, again, seems to be not Roman and first attested uh, in the 1830s. As we see, salt in the Roman and Greek world was uh, certainly a significant strategic resource and of course is the most common preservative agent, right? And used for seasoning and making garum. And the Roman salt trade was under state control from the earliest times. And there was a road called Salt Road, the Via Salaria, which owned its name to the role that it played in salt transportation. But salt wasn't prized as such and valuable as such. It was a trade that it was big and it was a big commercial commodity. And yes, for that reason, obviously, salt was important. But it wasn't a prestige object. Nobody made uh, jewelry out of salt or used it as an heirloom. It was a salt trade that was valuable. And it was such a high volume that that made it valuable. From Livy, we have the price of salt at um, a sextance, that is one sixth of a copper, of a copper coin, one sixtieth of a silver denarius. So Polybius, writing in the middle 100 BC, quotes a foot soldier pay as uh, two obols per day, that is to say one third of a denarius. And remember, the price of salt for a sextant was one sixtieth of a, of a denarius. So basically, we have a pound of salt about 330 grams costs uh, one twentieth of a foot soldier's daily wages. One might think of it as expensive by modern standards, but certainly it wasn't highly priced and valuable. In the British Isles, prehistoric man will have made salt from seawater or from the few places where inland brine springs have been discovered. Traces of these activities are difficult to identify, but archaeological evidence is now reaching back into the Bronze Age. Cheshire was on a trade route in Neolithic times, and there are salt fields where Iron Age Britons probably traded stone axe heads for salt. Archaeologists have also found evidence of Iron Age salt making in the area between Middlewich and Nantwich. Excavations have revealed brine kilns on which Iron Age type earthenware vessels of brine were heated. During Roman times, lead salt pans were used uh, in Britain in the sides of Middlewich, Nutwich, Northwich, and excavations in uh, these places have revealed extensive salt making settlements. The earliest evidence of salt making in Cheshire comes from pottery fragments dated to 600 BCE and shows that the Britons used. Uh, the technique which uh, the Romans so much said that they, they brought to backward um, Britain. And this is um, basically making salt by evaporating brine in earthen pots and then smashing the pots and expose the white cakes of salt. In the area of what is today North Wales, there were silver mines back in Roman times. And when the silver was extracted, lead remained. And then the Romans used this to make huge pans some weighing more than 300 pounds, for boiling uh, the brine. And it was, that was the first pan-evaporated uh, salt in England. Salt making continued in post-Roman Cheshire, at first through a period of Welsh control, and then as part of the Anglo-Saxon Mercia. The same pattern of trade will have continued, and later this attracted Viking influence from the north. The first documentary account of Anglo-Saxon salt making in Cheshire is found in the Doomsday Book of 1086. Doomsday Book also reveals one other secret of Anglo-Saxon salt making. We learn that there was a salt house in the manor of Barwardenstone, now lost, but thought to be the manor of Iscoid in Malusaisek, the detached part of Wales. In 1086 it was held by Robert Fitzhugh, but was claimed by the bishop and according to the 1094 Foundation Charter of St. Werbergs, Robert gave back the salt works to the abbey, and it was then known as Fulwich, a fourth Cheshire witch. Doomsday Book also records uh, manors which uh, owned coastal salt making sites along the coast uh, between Lincolnshire and Cornwall. Quoted estimates of the number of such manors are between 300 and 1195. But, uh, obviously, whatever the number, it seems to be considerable. 
coastal salt making in England took what advantage it could of solar evaporation and tended to be seasonal, but the final stage to give dry salt always involved evaporating the brine over a fire, at first in ceramic vessels and later in lead pans. If we move a couple of centuries later into a different continent, the continent of Africa and the formidable Sahara Desert, in the Middle Ages caravans of 40,000 camels carried salt from Taudeni to Timbuktu, a 435-mile journey taking as long as one month. In 1352, Ibn Battuta, one of the greatest uh, travelers of the Arab world, had journeyed overland across Africa. He visited the city of Tagaza, which he said was entirely built of salt, including an elaborate mosque. By the time European contact was uh, more uh, frequent in the 19th century and later, this fabled city of Western Sahara had been abandoned. One can imagine uh, the city of Tagaza as a, a sparkling white city, but being swept by the Sahara sands must have been a bit grey. Although salt construction impressed later travelers, salt blocks were the only material available for building, and Tagaza was probably a miserable work camp inhabited mostly by the slaves that they were forced to work on it and who completely depended on the arrival of caravans to bring them food. I hope you enjoyed uh, some uh, myth-busting of popular salt uh, myths and um, we dug deeper into the history, the real history of uh, salt, especially in uh, Greco-Roman times. Remember, if you liked uh, this episode, to share it uh, with uh, a few friends. And if you want to help me keep doing this podcast, you can uh, subscribe to my Patreon page, uh, which you can become a patron from $3 a month, and where you get exclusive recipes, videos, and writings about ancient food, but also you get the podcasts ad-free and earlier than normally released. So please, please, please go to Patreon and subscribe to the delicious legacy thanks to all my patreon backers so far you've been a great help and um, i've been thomas dinas and this was the delicious legacy podcast see you soon have a lovely week